Oh, hello, come in. Come in, come in. Oh, how nice to see you. I'm it's good, very good to see you. It's been a, a while, I'm afraid, because I've been away. Um, you may have come and called and I wasn't here because I was um, I was up in Derbyshire. I agreed to lead a... Well, it's a sort of pre-Advent retreat. It was on the theme of the Advent antiphons, but um, it was right up in Derbyshire and it was a very full programme and an entire week and preparation and coming back. So I'm only just re returning to the land of the living. Um, I was about to fill my pipe. This is a lovely Peterson Sherlock Holmes. But I don't know if I've ever shown you this. These are Peterson, they call them navy rolls. Have a look at this. It's absolutely wonderful. Look, the tobacco comes in these little thin, almost coins, sort of rolls, and you rub them. They're absolutely lovely. So I'm about to fill the pipe. But a pipe goes with the pipe. And I tell you what, I, I have a little look here. Um, I must properly reorganise this because I thought, oh, I'll just gradually learn where everything is. But my mind is still set on the previous study and I can't find things. However, I did find the other day, incongruously, between the poetry of Wendell Berry and the poetry of Sheslow Miwash, I found this little volume, which I really treasure. You can probably just see Edwin Muir. One Foot in Eden. What a fantastic title for a book of poems. Faber. This was the, the wonderful sort of austere, rather minimalist Faber approach. Lots of blank pages, you know, just the title up there. Um, this is a first edition, although a second impression. 1956, so it's the year before I was born, but only a couple of years before uh, Edwin Muir died, so it's his last. And, uh, and it's beautifully printed and... Um, it has, in my opinion, several of his very best poems. And, um, you know, that's encouraging in itself uh, for those of us that are poets who are past the first flush of their youth, that, um, that people might, might get better as they go along. And in fact, that's also true of the two poets on either side of this volume, um, um, Wendell Berry, and Chesler Miller I mean, should both carried on writing, writing very good. I'm, what you do, this is with these little medallions, is you sort of rub them in your fingers, and um, it's rather a nice process, actually. If you take the view that sometimes people smoke really just to do some, have something to do with their fingers, your your quid's in with a pipe because the proportion of fiddling about to smoking is much higher. You hardly smoke at all. And of course, you don't inhale, so it's all a bit of a, a kind of calming ritual. I suppose if I'd been born into a Tibetan Buddhist household, I would be doing this with prayer beads or prayer flags. But as it is, I do it with this. Now, I thought we'd read Actually, just a couple of poems from this. Um, it's very moist, this tobacco. So, my little rolls keep it so. So, let's look at the title poem here One Foot in Eden. It's a wonderful poem. And the very, I mean, there's almost a poem in the title, I think. Um, The great story of the fall of the, is really a story not of original sin, of course. Uh, the original sin is a secondary thing and not really original at all. The original thing is blessing. The original thing is, is a beautiful paradisal state, a, a rightness of things, the garden, the perfection of all, walking with God in the garden in the cool of the evening, no hiding or shame or subterfuge or shadow falling across anything, either the relationships between humanity and God or the relationships within humanity as between Adam and Eve, that somehow there's an idea that we all retain buried deep what Chesterton called the buried sunrise of wonder, some memory of that, and that it haunts us. And therefore, that's why we feel... 
We don't feel that the present fallen world is normal. We feel there's something wrong with the shadows that death casts and with the tragedies. We, we experience them as an outrage against something more primal in our nature. And yet, in this world where there is so much suffering and so much calamity and tragedy, there is also, by the same token, astonishing heroism and hope and courage and kindness and charity and all kinds of things have come out as a result of that. And these are all reflected in this poem. But the other thing one might just say about this poem, you don't need to know this, but <coughs> Edwin Muir was born in Orkney. Well, actually not on the island of Orkney, but on a little island just off Orkney. And although, you know, he was born in the 1870s or 80s, I've forgotten exactly the year, he... he he reckons it's as though he was living in, 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 you know, in a completely pre-industrial age. You know, he could have been born in the 18th or 17th or 16th or 15th centuries for the way they lived. Was changed. And then his father lost his farm and he ended up moving from there to Glasgow, to slums of Glasgow and working in a, in a horrible sort of glue and char charcoal factory that ground down the bones of animals and amidst the stench and the poverty and the pollution and... It was a horrible and rapid transition, and it it underlined his sense of an, an earlier paradise and of the world we live in now and of, of the yearning towards it. Uh, and I think all of that is is here in this amazing poem, One Foot in Eden. I love the idea that we all have one foot in Eden. So here it is. One foot in Eden still, I stand and look across the other land. The world's great day is growing late, Yet strange these fields that we have planted so long with crops of love and hate. Time's handiworks by time are haunted, and nothing now can separate the corn and tares compactly grown, the armorial weed in stillness bound about the stalk. These are our own. Evil and good stand thick around in the fields of charity and sin, where we shall lead our harvest in. Yet still from Eden springs the root as clean as on the starting day. Time takes the foliage and the fruit and burns the archetypal leaf to shapes of terror and of grief scattered along the winter way. But famished field and blackened tree Bare flowers in Eden never known. Blossoms of grief and charity bloom in these darkened fields alone. What had Eden ever to say of hope and faith and pity and love until was buried all its day and memory found its treasure trove? Strange blessings never in paradise fall from these beclouded skies. I, I, it's wonderful in so many ways. Of course, it's, it's written around harvest and maybe they've been burning the stubble and you get that sense of the blackening. But it's also written with that harvest reading, that, that parable that Jesus tells about the kingdom, about the, the wheat and the tares growing together and the disciples wanting to rush in and, and weed out the tares straight away. And he says, no, 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 don't do that. You might pull up. By the root, you might uproot the good seed. Leave it, leave it till the end. These things will separate in the end. It's a counsel of patience and tolerance, but also a tremendous insight. Uh, and this feeling about not wanting to uproot, you know, where is the root? And of course, this, this poem answers that question. Um, Yet still from Eden springs the root, as clean as on the starting day. Time takes the foliage and the fruit. So that's a really interesting idea, isn't it? That somehow we're still rooted in Eden. Yes, time, time, the destroyer, comes and takes so much away. You know, uh, you know, time, that subtle thief of youth and all of that. Um, how too soon hath time, that subtle thief of youth, stolen on his wing my three and twentieth year, says Keats. And yet... Even in this fallen world, he talks about these fruits, these new fruits, these blossom and blossoms of grief and charity bloom on these darkened fields alone. And I love the idea that memory finds a treasure trove. It's 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 a superb, it's a superb poem in in, in my opinion. So this 
uh, book <coughs> also contains um, two others of his uh, his finest poems in my thinking. It contains the Incarnate One, which I've written about quite a lot. And it also contains his, perhaps one of his most famous poems, apart from the one about the horses, um, his poem about the Annunciation, which perhaps as we're beginning to move towards towards Advent uh, is not a bad poem to read. So I'll finish with this. Now in 1939, after this terrible time in Glasgow, but maybe with these buried Edenic memories, um, Edwin Muir had a mystical experience. He had a moment of complete disclosure of timelessness coming into time, which converted him back to the Christianity of his childhood, and he became, in my opinion, one of the great Christian poets. And I wonder if this poem about the Annunciation isn't in some way informed by his own brief experience of, of ecstasy. So, the Annunciation. The angel and the girl are met. Earth was the only meeting place, for the embodied never yet travelled beyond the shore of space. The eternal spirits in freedom go. See, they have come together. See, whilst the destroying minutes flow, each reflects the other's face, till heaven in hers and earth in his shine steady there. He's come to her from far beyond the furthest star, feathered through time. Immediacy of strangers' strangeness is the bliss that from their limbs all movement takes. Yet the increasing rapture brings so great a wonder that it makes each feather tremble on his wings. Outside the window, footsteps fall into the ordinary day and with the sun along the wall pursue their unreturning way that was ordained in eternity. Sounds perpetual roundabout rolls its numbered octaves out and hoarsely grinds its battered tune. But through the endless afternoon these neither speak nor movement make but stare into their deepening trance as if their gaze would never break. I love that poem. I love the way that the stillness and the eternal moment of the gaze between the angel and Mary is kind of in a moment of suspended time. And But outside, it's all going outside the window. Footsteps fall into the ordinary day, but for them, there's this unbroken gaze. It's a beautiful, beautiful poem. So that is Edwin Muir, something of a mystic and a very fine a Scots poet. Um, uh, uh, admired by T.S. Eliot and therefore uh, published by Faber in this very lovely edition, which is just a year older than I am. Anyway, lovely to see you and thanks for dropping by. Sorry it's been so long. <laughs>